Hi everyone and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host David Holloway and it's brilliant as always to be here with you. And joining me is a man who looks really nice in this light, Paul P- Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? Oh, thank you, David. And, and might I say you look very so nice. So I did in, actually in Google um, backhanded compliments and that was one that was a great website that had 10 or 12 backhanded compliments. And so I thought that one, some of them are outright insulting. I thought, well, we're not about insults. So I thought that one. Yeah, I, th- I think you could have made it sound more backhanded if you'd emphasise the, the words differently. So if you said, over to a man who looks nice in this light, then uh, that definitely would have been a really good backhanded compliment. <laughs> so, no, great to be here again as always. And um, we've just wrapped up an interview with our latest guest, the brilliant Jenny Conley. Um as you'll hear in the interview, I'm a bit of a fan of the band, um, the Decembrists, um, and I believe for good reason. So they're, they're a band that have been around for sort of 22 years. Uh, and th- uh, Paul, Paul, you say in the interview that they're a band that, that write about things of substance. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the thing that, that uh, strikes me about the Decembrists, and, and for, for our viewers and listeners, if you've not heard them, We'll have links that you can pl- please check them out because the the lyrics uh, they mean something. They're, the songs are about things. It does, and and I mentioned to Jenny that I mean it's the only time I've watched a music video in the last probably twenty years, but at least the last five years has actually brought a tear to my eye. Um, and we'll link to that. So that's the once in my life video. But yeah, um, Jenny is an incredibly diverse player, as you'll hear across a range of keyboard instruments. Um, it was a thrill to catch up to her and, and yeah, if you're interested in everything from organ, electric, piano and accordion, um, she really does some great tips for, for other players. This one's definitely worth a listen. Jenny, welcome, a huge welcome to you. Can't thank you enough. Um, once again, we're asking guests to, to take out some of their valuable time on a Friday night. And we do really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Um, so well, I thought we'd just kick off with uh, us telling us a little bit about yourself and your upbringing. So just tell us about... What got Jenny Connolly into music in the first place? You know, a childhood experiences of music um, into your early adulthood. Oh, wow. This is cool. Um, I don't get interviewed that much. Okay. Um, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, which is on the west coast of the U.S. Um, I always, we had a piano at the house, and I always loved to tinker around. I guess, I don't remember this, but we went and saw Star Wars. It's like 1970, whatever, six or something, and I came home and played it on the piano, the theme on the piano. And plus, my mom loves music, and she, she when she was growing up, didn't have the means to take lessons. So she had all of us girls, I have a twin sister and an older sister, we all had to take piano for three years. Because we, she wanted us to live out her dream, and um, then you could just quit if you wanted. So I ended up staying with it because I really did like it. Like practicing wasn't a hard thing for me to do. I felt very. I had a great teacher, a lot of encouragement. Um, so anyway, that went really well for me. Um, but you know, I definitely liked classical music, and that was the first music I listened to probably. Um, besides the Carpenters and Donnie and Marie and um, a couple other, we had like five records at the house, and those were two of them, Oak Ridge Boys. Um, so my musical knowledge was about this, like, Bach. And then um, I got way into rock. Like, I played orchestra, I played cello a little bit. Um, mostly I ended up being a, an accompanist. They realized that I was better better utilized as a pianist than a cellist since I had that background for so long that anyway I did a lot of accompanying and I got into you know just how we all do when you're a kid got into rock and I did a deep dive into classic rock like beginning in sixth grade maybe I was in like the alternative crowd I guess you'd say like we'd go buy our clothes at the Salvation Army and um the military surplus store and listened to Depeche Mode and um, then it went deeper into like classic rock and I got into the Grateful Dead. I have a whole hippie era. We could talk about that here. I'm just going all the way through. And then um, for college, 
I wanted to go to, I was really into environmental issues and that kind of thing. And so I started school as a forestry major at Oregon State, um, which is a big forestry school. And then I ended up not being able to, not loving that um, because I I was such an idealist child and wanted to save the trees. And they begin with sustainable harvest and all these things that I was not even prepared to talk about. Um, So I did end up majoring in music and did a piano major there. And my freshman year, I met a guy, um, a fellow named Caleb Clotter um, in the music building. And he had a folk duo going with his childhood friend, Dave. And he invited me to come over and jam. And I didn't know how to do that. Um, So he showed me, he's like, well, do you know what a C chord is? I'm like, sure. One, three, five, and then it's like, okay. Um, he learned in a totally different way. But he got me out of my shell in terms of like using my musical knowledge to play with other people. So my first gigs with that band were hilarious. Like my charts I made, like a lot of the songs were just two chords. Like maybe, let's example, C, F. I'd be like, for every bar I'd write C, 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 F, 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 C, 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 Just like not intuitive at all. Just like count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that took a lot of, that took a lot of transition in that point, learning how to play with other people. So anyway, that's... And how did that progress from from the, that plodding first effort to actually you're feeling comfortable doing that was it just purely repetition that you know I'm jamming with these people all the time or did you have a bit of a mentor or someone that really got you going in that area well this is a good I also met another college was great for me um I met all these great so back in high school I tried to jam with some friends I was a prog rocker so like me and some guys we got like I had a rush songbook and we like got the rush we're trying to play rush first of all Horrible idea for your first jam. Um, maybe something like John Prine, Bob Dylan would have been better. Um, but anyway, so that was a fail. So I was like, I can't play with people because I was reading out of the book. And we were trying to do like, you know, um, Tom Sawyer and stupid. Anyway, um, so Kayla was helpful with the rhythm. And then I met this guy, Ross, um, who was an amazing guitar player, um, real free spirit used to ride his bike with no hands with his guitar and running around town and he taught me the blues scale so that was the beginning of my like oh there's other scales besides major and minor scales and then I of course overused it so if there was a C chord I'd be like like that run through the blues scale and then my bandmates at the time it was just Dave and I Dave and Caleb and I the three of us um they were sweet and open and letting me do whatever. Um, probably my biggest influences of the time that I was trying to emulate were probably um, Brett Midland from The Grateful Dead. He was the Grateful Dead drum, uh, keyboardist in the 80s and early 90s before he died. I think he died like in like 93 or something. But I'd seen him play multiple times and that record without a net. The, that live, I don't know if you know The Grateful Dead, but that's like a live record from that era. Really, sh- like, so I was trying to emulate him. So I was really, that was helpful because he uses a lot of major scales, um, put some blues stuff in there, but he's not really a blues piano player like a lot of the other rock players are, like Nicky Hopkins or someone like that. So, and our band was very hippie and happy. And so it just took time. I used to overplay and the bass, we've got a bass player, which is now Nate, who plays in the Decemberists, was the bass player in Colobo as well. And I would be playing, like, the uh, the octaves or whatever. He's like, Jenny, you're in my zone. Like, back off. Um, let me play the bass. You find your space on the keyboard. You have all this range. Don't be in my world. Don't play where the guitars, at least especially don't play with the junk. Don't do that. So I played a lot of high stuff, melodic stuff. And then like same with the Decemberists. And I do a lot of like downbeat, like downbeat, then accentuating the downbeat, but not rhythm much because when the guitar is strumming away, you don't need the piano to do that. Unless it's like a piano 
based um, song, which there are a few in the Decemberist catalog. Yeah, that's great. And just just as an aside, um, we've had a couple of viewers um, even mention Colobo as a great band they love. They're from Oregon themselves and knowing this interview is coming up. So you, you certainly had a following at the time. Yeah, we did. I mean, I think we were lucky that we started that band in college. And, you know, when you're in your late teens and your early 20s, you just want to hang out with people, you know. And so we would play house parties. Everyone would come. And then when we got out of college, people that – because part of the band began at Oregon State where I went. And then the other half of the band was at Lewis and Clark College, which was a small liberal arts college in Portland. But it was a private school, so people from all over the U.S. were going there. So when that when we got when we graduated, our fans were like from all over the country, and so we got to, we went on tour mostly the West, but then ended up doing pretty well for about ten years. I actually we actually paid our health insurance, like so we felt very successful to not have to because back then there was no now there's a government health plan in the state of Oregon, but back then there was nothing so. So, uh, Jenny, you, you mentioned uh, in your formative years how um, you went for a bit of a hippie phase. Still in there kind of a little bit. Folk mu- and, and folk music's obviously what I assume was important to you then and is important to you now. Uh, other, other musical styles that, that inspired you as a young person? So you mentioned prog rock. Obviously, you had a fairly eclectic sort of taste. There was, there was the classical which from your learning, but... You know, what, what were the key musical styles that, that you loved then that, that sort of led you I think my, um, what would be that that phrase? Like the uh, the band that opened up rock for me, which is weird, but it's Jethro Tull. So coming from a classical background and I heard the harpsichord on that music, I was like, damn, I get this. And I loved it. I still love it. So I got, I got to prog rock right away. And then... Bought a Jethro Tull box set, and then later delved into the heavier stuff and got into Zeppelin. Like you asked me, like favorite records, like Houses of the Holy is like that's my holy grail. I mean, so it's like I love, and then I got into metal. It's like pe- it's pe- people that you meet, like a guy I worked with was really into metal, and I'm like, well, what is it about metal that you like? And then um, all of a sudden, I'm listening to Metallica, and like, yeah, I I like that. Um, I like pop too, but you know, I was always so kind of trying not to be trendy, I guess. That was, my friends and I were like, oh, we're not trendy. Like, we're not going to listen to Madonna. Like, though she's great. And I listened to, you know, R.E.M. and U2 and those bands, Peter Gabriel, because I was a Genesis fan. And so I guess I wasn't listening to the music that my peers were listening to, really. Yeah, no, and and probably linked to that. Just you mentioned your sort of upbringing, the, your first band. Where where did the accordion come into things? How how did that sort of uh, capability and um, I mean, I, I love your accordion playing, but where did that work into things for you? You know, that came during Colobo le- Land or times. I uh, we would play a lot of festivals and a lot of these like camping out festivals where we would camp and we'd all sit in a group and campfire and everyone's jamming and I like to have I don't really I'm not someone that knows a lot of songs so I'm not like singing the tunes I'm just like I want to jam along but I could not with the my keyboard's electric it's in the car it sucks so I decided to get a concertina but a concertina is tuned like that was I did not jump into that that easily so I found a piano accordion so that was probably in like 90 eight or something and then on the last record Clobo record I think I might have played it on one song but it wasn't very very much and I was just just playing the right side of it I wasn't really delving into the instrument as a whole um but actually when I met Colin was probably in 99 he was like looking for an accordion player and I was like oh yeah I play accordion but I really just played like half of the accordion so, like, the first album, Cassidy's and Cutouts, there's a song called The Cautionary Song, which he really wanted to have that sound of, like, the, the buttons going, chunk, 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 but I couldn't do that. So I would, like, right hand, I went, like, boom, chunk, chunk, boom, chunk, chunk. So I totally faked it. 
I faked it all the way until our third record. I actually took some lessons and um, got my left hand to join the join the club. Interested in how you then moved from Colobo to Decemberists. Oh, yes. So that was like late 90s. That band sort of just fell apart because there was like multiple songwriters. And that can work in some bands like Gomez and there's other examples of that working. But it just stopped working for us. I think it was just like we were so young when we started. Those guys all wanted to do their own thing. And the music started to get more and more specifically like Caleb started to become really interested in bluegrass, so he went that way, and Dave wanted to write this real straightforward pop music, which I'm like, oh, boring. And then, like, um, so we ended up splitting up. I ended up playing with Caleb's, like, solo band after Colobo broke up, and then I just became, like, kind of what I am now. I um, started playing with everybody. I just started playing with all kinds of people in Portland, which was a great learning. And then, so it was only about a year after Global broke up that I met Colin Twisted Tail, but our Caleb from the from Colobo's ex-wife, who was my friend, and she had known Colin's old band Tarkio because she was like our publicist slash label person. And she knew Tarkio from back when Colin was like in college. So she... So he moved to Portland. I, I didn't know Tarkio, but she brought me to the first December show, which was like, at that time, Nate was playing and Ezra. So it was like Dave Lang and this Ezra, Nate and Colin. And I went, I loved the music. And then Decca or December is her full name, introduced me to Colin. And she's like, hey, and I heard you played accordion. I'm like, yeah. Um, and then, but barely. And then... He was like, well, I'm doing a, he, he would, had been asked to do a project with the Portland Film Institute, and that was to write music to a silent film. So he asked Nate and I to join him to write this music for this silent film, and that was my first. We hung out at his loft apartment. Like, he lived in this crappy, like, warehouse, um, and then wrote that piece of music, and then he's like, well, do you want to be in my band? And I was like, I don't know, man. I just got off the road. I am ready to be, like, in town. But he's like, we're not going to go on tour. <laughs> and then look at us now. So, I mean, and it's 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 going to be really hard to encapsulate this in, in this short interview. But, I mean, you, you've been around now. It's it's 20, 20 22. Years. 22 20, years. Yeah. Yeah, so so looking back now, obviously um, it, it's been an incredible experience. Did did you have any awareness at that early stage that yeah this had some real life in it, or it was just oh this is the next project I'll help out here and see how it goes? Well, what was different from Colobo is that first of all our crowds were very small for a long time, and I wasn't and but we had critical success meaning like we were written up in pitchfork like clover was never a critic starling we were like fun music it was like the lyrics were like maybe second the second thing we talked about like colin's all about the story mm. really high quality lyrics and he's a great singer and i felt first time i saw him i was like this music is so different and weird and cool um i feel like there was something to it but it was a slow burn like we played these little clubs in town for like four years and it was swear to God, it was like Colin's roommates would come out and that was like it. And like my brother-in-law, um, but we got a label, small label deal. And then when things started, started to bubble, kill rock stars did buy that first record from hush records, which was our first label. And then things kind of started to change. And then it was exponential because, we were in that perfect time of the internet was just starting as a place to talk about music, but people still bought records. So we would go on the road and sell all these records. And I mean, we were like, oh God, Napster is going to kill music. Little did we know that, no, it did not. And Spotify, I mean, it's not killing it, but you know what I mean? Um, so we had this perfect, I felt like a perfect storm of opportunity then we found a great booking agent with Kevin French, who we still have, put us in great rooms. And then we just toured our butts off. In the old Colobo van, we just 
got back in there, had like 300,000 miles on it, and we toured a lot. And so, we're, and we're definitely going to talk about your live work with the Decemberist. Um, so, I probably want to just start off there with, uh, for our viewers and listeners that aren't aware of the Decemberist, which would be few, but for those of you who aren't, we'll have links in the show notes to a whole range of, of the Decemberist work. But I'm going to pick on something, Jenny, that's most recent as far as one of your videos. And it's one of the ones, I'm, I'm a bit of a cynical person. Um, and and I'm, we're of similar age, Jenny. So it's, I've been around since you know <laughs> Star Wars. Star Wars was a pivotal moment for me as well. Yeah. Um, but the once in my life video, which we'll be posting in the show notes, and I, I've mentioned this in the introduction as well to to, to some extent. It it literally brought tears to my eyes, and it really mm-hmm. encapsulates everything you have said about Colin's approach to songwriting, what the band do to. Um, bring that to life musically it's just it's just incredible and shows the maturity to which the band has has come um how so that was a long-winded way of asking a question how much is that planned and so i know songwriting is obviously planned to some extent you have the you know you, you need to write stuff but how has that maturity been a result of really good planning and discipline versus the mm. fact that you've just got, got a whole bunch of really great songs that resonate with people? I love that. Uh, yeah, there's not super planning. I mean, there's things that happen that create things that happen later. Like that video came from Autumn to Wild, who was our photographer for many albums and became a friend. And so I think that's where the awareness came in of that song for her that meant so much to her because her brother is the character in that in there and he is had a hard life because of his body type and she was like I really want to she's always wanted to make this movie and then she was like this is the song so I feel like just how one thing begets another thing that's how that sort of came along I do think that Colin has more planning than I do in terms of how things go like I know like after we did Hatches of Love, he's like, I really feel like we need to make a straightforward record or our people are going to be like, we're out. Um, so, I mean, that might have been a natural progression, but um, I think it's about half and half. I think the songs come to him, and I think that wherever we are at mus- as musicians happens too. Like, before I'll Be Your Girl, like, I had just started a little synth trio with two other friends. And so I bought a new synthesizer and I've been something doing all the synthesizer work and using drum machine. And then we got working with John Congleton and he's like, why don't you try this? And I'm like, I have a sound for that. And that's like, that just happened to come like together like that. Plus Chris Funk is always dabbling in alternate soundscapes. So he's always willing to like, if there's been any synth on any record Mostly it's probably Funk's idea. Um, so that was another example of like how maybe a band member might have influenced the sound. Um, but so much of it is coming from Colin and whatever he's into at the time. Like I wouldn't doubt if there's going to be a song about he's been really into King Arthur. Who knows? We might, we might get an Arthurian ballad coming up soon. I don't know. That's right. And, and just um, not wanting to harp on just about once in my life, but you mentioned that the the synth stuff, I mean, it, it is the synth stuff in that track that makes that track, I would say, aside from the, the what a wonderful lyric and the overall structure, it is that mm-hmm. synth sound. That's the first thing that jumped out and grabbed me right. as a player. Just amazing, yeah. And that was, um, so I used to play that part on the organ because a lot of times these songs we'll play live during, like, we'll, do, we'll learn it kind of in sound check and then we'll just throw it out there at a show, see what happens. I, and I played the organ, so then I got to the studio. I'm like, I'm going to play organ on this. And I just got my organ fixed up and I was so excited to, like, play organ because I've been playing around with different sounds I could get on it. I only played organ on one thing and it was, like, one low note, like, brrr, and that's it. But whatever. Um, but that was the sound and then... Colin and John Congleton were just like, well, let's move it over to like something that sounds like big and takes up the whole, the whole space. And I'm like, well, and the Dave Smith, my prophet just like had it. Um, so I don't know what this patch is called. I just tweaked it a little bit. It really is just right there. It's actually like two different sounds layered together 
and it is huge. So, uh, Jenny, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, you mentioned before just then the part of how the creative process works around how, mm -hmm. how these songs come together in the Decemberists. But, but I'm really curious how the nature of that, uh, you know, may have changed over time. You know, for, and for our listeners and viewers who haven't had an opportunity uh, maybe yet to listen to this music, I'm sure you will soon uh, post this podcast, that there's, that there's, as Jenny said, these songs are about something. They're, they're significant and they're meaningful and then the lyrics are really key and important. And I'm wondering um, from the time when, you know, if I look at the partnership of, or the relationship of you and Colin and Chris, has, that, has your input as musicians changed into the creative process as you're providing input to Colin's vision over that 22-year you know, period mean, that you've been working Yeah, together? I think so. I think at the beginning we were definitely more like, what's this going to be? And we would rehearse every week and we were leaning heavily on our instruments that we, like I was, like Colin just wanted me to play accordion and that was it. Um, but I think on the five song EP, which was our first real album, there was a Rhodes in the studio and we played it and he's like, oh, you play electric piano? I'm like, yeah. And then that changed. But I think we definitely were leaning on the Decemberist -y sounds more first. Like Chris was playing a lot more pedal steel. He wasn't like experimenting with um, hurdy gurdies and that kind of thing yet. We were just sort of making a simple thing. And I don't think we got into synth land. Well, actually, the second record was when we were like, let's get a. Colin really wanted to have a string section. He wanted a lush sound. So that's when there were some synthesizers came into play. And I think over time, it's been more and more we've given more power to like the producer person and Collins had more veto power. Like I bring something in and he'll be like, nah, I'm like, okay. Uh, where maybe before I would fight harder for it. Um, I feel like now we're just sort of, we got this thing going on. that's just real easy and we figured out how it works. And if you notice, we don't, we don't put tour as much. We're just like, everyone's got their families and Colin's so busy with, everything he's doing um we're just kind of all like floating around like i'll be here when you need me kind of thing yeah. and and I, I know last year you did some touring and it's probably a good segue to your live work what what's really struck me from looking at a few videos from your um u.s dates from late last year just yeah you've matured from a band where you you had particular instruments and your rig is quite impressive and I don't just mean from a a, a a technological viewpoint but I mean you've got you've got to have that whole range you've got everything from your accordion to your synths to your organ and an electric piano um, it's it's quite quite the rig now I know and I've got so many channels I think I only I think Chris Funk does beat me by channels but like in everything I have like my Hammond like the Leslie gets mic'd in three three mics so then my Keyboard is stereo, and then my Mellotron, the Prophet, the accordion, and my vocal. So yeah, I'm nine channels. I bet Chris has got me beat though. He's got like three amps up there. Um, um, but what what I love too is um, you mentioned before how you'll throw a song out there, and what what I noticed even in that tour last year, you road tested. Um, a, a couple of songs, what I'm assuming will be whatever comes up next mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for you guys. And, and I loved one of the videos. Uh, you did this wonderful uh, piano solo on what I was assuming was the, the, the roads or whatever. And um, you called out halfway um, through the song that you were covering from the guitar player who should have been doing a solo instead of you. So you obviously are truly road testing these songs, which is brilliant. And you do it so well. Right. We are like, there was, Funk and I kept trying to figure out how to do that solo, you know, we're like, should one person just take the whole thing? Sometimes I would, sometimes he would take the whole thing, sometimes he would forget, sometimes he'd forget what key we were in. Um, and then Colin's like, I was doing it on piano, but he's like, I think I know um, what song that is. That's the, uh, we, go then, yeah. come down, Be burial ground maybe, meet at the burial ground. Yeah, the, the one I was watching was the William Fitzwilliam. Oh one. yeah, yeah, William Fitzwilliam, da 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 da, -da. yeah. Um, so we were experimenting with like piano sounds too, like that's what it should be, but we should do something else. And then maybe it should be organ or, so I think every show we did something different. Um, just trying to figure out what settled in. We are going to start recording some stuff 
in a month or two and we'll see what actually trickles down and maybe there'll be some perspective from the tour to um, help us yeah. with that wow. info. But it just seems, again, talking about maturity of the band, that you can do that. You can road test. You can do it effectively. And I think uh, there was another video with Burial Ground where um, you were asked at the start of the song, so do you know what you're doing? And I, I just love that as a weekend <laughs> warrior cover band musician because that's what we ask each other all the time. I just love it. Oh, yeah. Do you know what key we're in? Or like call one and be like, what gear am I in? Which means what? where does this capo go on his guitar? <laughs> you're in second gear. Um and, and just one last, apologies for a series of observations, but again, in doing research for the show, I'm watching your work on accordion. Um, and I swear this is true before I realised your involvement. It really stood out to me. Your accordion playing was similar to the Pogues mm. uh, and also an, an iconic Australian band, Weddings, Parties, Anything, that were themselves inspired by the Pogues and oh. then realised that you actually founded a Pogues tribute band. I'm a huge so tell fan. us a little bit about there. Tell us a little bit about your love of the Pogues and and what oh. led to you actually doing "Kiss My Royal Irish Ass." <laughs> right. From. Yeah, that's actually Colin named our band. He's like, if you have a Pogues cover band, you should call it "Kiss My Royal Irish Ass." I'm like, we're gonna do it. I'm like, you have to sing. And the first year he did sing, I'll think of it. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, um, no, James Fernley is like one of my favorite accordionists. I mean, he really goes for it. Like, you can hear, you know, accordion. I probably first heard accordion in pop music with with uh, with um, with um REM's acoustic record, Automatic for the People. I was like, ooh, that's nice. And that's kind of how I play is kind of like, I think that's Mike Mills just, like, doinking around. I don't think he – well, he plays piano, so he's just pulling the right hand. But James takes it – James Friendly from the Pogues takes it to a next – he's next level, like – and I read his book, and he um, he's self-taught on the accordion and I think he just jumped right in and just went for it because he's amazing and actually in the Pogues cover band I'd met James we'd had a accordion uh we were like dueling or whatever in LA once and uh he won of course but we became at least texting friends and I was like I need to know what are the notes on um Bottle of Smoke, where this reel is just nuts. Like, cannot slow it down enough to get the part. And he's like, oh, we all play different stuff all the time. Don't worry about it. It's like, don't learn it exact. Um, that was the spirit. But, yeah, so now that band, Chris Funk's in it, Scott McCoy, who plays in R.E.M. often. Um, Ezra, our first drummer, is in that band. Casey Neal, who I play with a lot. Jesse Emerson, who was our bass player for the second Decemberist record. Um, Her Majesty is in that, and Hans Araki, just all Portland pals. We haven't played for a while, but um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing sound. We'll definitely post links to the couple of videos I've seen. But yeah, I just it, it I found it very amusing that yeah your style, and I thought this sounds very Pogues-ish. And then yeah, it's, it's, I yeah, definitely it's... am playing, copying, really inspired by James Fernley, for sure. It's it's the gold standard of band names too. I, must I mean, say. people so, are always like uh, Kamura. I'm like, well, <laughs> it would be, but I think it's a James Joyce quote, and it comes out of um, I can't think Maybe. what song that's in. Okay, yeah, I'm all right. Oh, Trans I think it's in Trans Trans Metropolitan is the the tune that that's that phrase is in. You got to be kind of a Pogues yeah. lover to to recognize that. Well, that's what's a good band name because if you are really into the Pugs and you want to see a Pugs tribute, you're already going, these people get it. Yeah. So they understand. So it's, that's what's a, a code to it's your true. listeners, to your followers. Yeah. So I love that. Um, I, I'm interested in where Casey Neal and the Norway Rats fits in to the grand scheme of your mm. uh, your work and how, that, how, how that's how been. Well, I've known Casey for probably 30 years. He was sort of in the – back in Colobo days, he was on that same circuit – he was kind of in that folky scene that was kind of punk slash. He was like an Earth First forest activist and got really, and he has a lot of songs about that. And um, I just met him through that world. And then he just asked me to play in his band and I had for the last probably 30 years, like a, here and there. So I like kind of, he has a lot more Pogues influence than I think Colin does, though that could be argued. Um, but I feel very comfortable in Casey's band. 
And he kind of calls on the same, he has many of the same influences as Colin too. Maybe a little bit heavier on the Joe Strummer, um, punkier side of things and political different, different focuses, harder probably, but um, I really enjoy playing with both of them. Um, and with with all your pretty vandals, that's an amazing song, and the clip is great. It, it, just to go off on a tangent, do you find from your experience now have video music videos somewhat become redundant as far as that they're not really a driver of of anything too significant? Given as you mentioned, Spotify before, and the real money or the real ability to make a living comes from playing live. Do you yeah? Do you find there's just less music videos being made? I think, I don't know, I feel like videos are now more important because it's like, that's your radio. Like, that's your promotion. True. Like, I was just like, I'm making a little accordion record that's coming out in March, and I just finished making, like, little like little videos for each of the songs because then I could put them on Instagram, and then I can, people can, plus instrumental music is maybe less, uh, people just have an easier time if they're looking at something, even if it's just grass going like this, um, hearing solo accordion music. But I feel like it's the way to market. People don't look at their phones and just listen really at all. So I feel like, I think the big budget videos are kind of gone. I think that's the difference. Cause yeah, there's, that's probably, yeah. they're not making any money. Like they used to, even our first couple videos were our label paid for and they were a big budget. And I don't know where they get played, except for they're on YouTube. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, I think you've encapsulated my question better than I did. Yeah, that's that's right. It's the big budget videos. Yeah. And now we have, you know, this like iMovie. Like I got us I'm no great video person. I just can I can do the simple things and that's kind of all you need sometimes. Yeah. Absolutely. Dark Prairie was the one that I wanted to ask you about as mm -hmm. well. So tell us about how that evolved. That was a Chris Funk creation. Um, he was looking for a way to play folkier music, and he wanted to play instrumental music. And so he asked. It started out with Nate and I and Chris, and then our friend John Newfeld, who's an amazing acoustic guitar player, and then Annalisa Tornfeld, who played fiddle. And so we made that um, our first album, and we all wrote. We all he just wanted to write music, and that was fun. And then Annalisa is an amazing singer, so of course you just can't like ignore that. So we, she sings a couple tunes. Actually, I just talked to her yesterday. She she left town. She and her husband were like, we're out. Portland's like too expensive. They had a bunch of kids. They wanted to. Now they're in Kentucky, living on a farm. So she's living her best bluegrass life. Um, so that band's not gonna do any more projects. But that was such a fun project for me to be able to write to write music and then play it live and tour and get in that scene. I love that, like, bluegrass Americana scene. I got to meet Sarah Jarose and Aoife O'Donovan and Sarah Watkins and just all these cool, rad players. Jenny, before David mentioned, and I quote, you have an impressive rig, um, but uh, and we, we, you did give us a very quick drive-by of your, uh, your, your favorite pieces in there, but I'm wondering, if we could just get, for the benefit of our, our listeners and viewers, whilst we're not a technical or, or gear podcast, we do like to know what's the preferred touring rig items of our, of our guests. So, yeah, what's your ideal sort of life okay, setup good question. right now? I love this kind of thing. Um, I've got a Hammond B3 um, and a 122 Leslie that goes with it. That's the, that's the heart. And then on top, I have a Nord Stage, which I play piano and... Wurlitzer mostly, those two sounds. I have a couple synth patches that I use, but mostly it's just those two sounds. And then um, the Dave Smith Prophet, which is a lot of that I'll Be Your Girl sounds are coming from there. The Mellotron, which like two records ago, um, What a Terrible World, What a Beautiful World, um, was heavy on Mellotron. Um, lots of Mellotron strings, lots of Mellotron horns, voices, so that I use that heavily. And now I use it for any string parts that I'm trying to emulate because sometimes the strings on the Nord sound like too good and I want them to sound, because they're fake, let's just make mm -hmm. them sound like fake yeah. strings. And also I'm usually playing piano at the same yeah. time so then I can 
so I put the piano over the organ and then the synths over here. So usually I will do the strings on the Mellotron while I'm playing the piano up here. And then I have a glockenspiel, which is like a percussionist glockenspiel, so it's the bigger one. Sorry, you can't see it in the window here. but And that's over in the middle. Um, and then my accordion is a Potosa Futura model, which is like a 2005. Um, I bought it used. And if, if you're accordionist out there, it's a small scale. It's a, just two reeds. It's a middle so single reed, and then there's a musette reed, just the two the same note. So that's a really light, simple thing. I have a nicer, bigger one that I like to play now because it's big, but that one works great for the band. So that's it. Oh, and then when I go to Europe, um, cause I can't bring the Hammond. Um, I have this from the nineties, I think it's 99. I have this Roland VK seven keyboard. Um, and I play it through a motion sound 145 solid state Leslie which I just played that rig, this I played with Jerry Joseph um, for New Year's and I, I got to be as loud as I can because he's super loud. That rig is loud and it sounds pretty good. And that keyboard is like older than most of my friend's kids and it is just still working. So I'm just like. Yeah, the VK7 is a workhorse, isn't it? Yeah. It is and um, I just got a transformer and I actually bought a Hammond XK2 over in Europe so I could use, but you know what? I sold it cause I didn't like the sounds as well. Well, there you go. I mean, I think also part of it is what you get used to. Like, I don't know if I need something new until I try something else and I'm like, Ooh, that is better. But just my ear, like forever I had a 145 Leslie that only had break and fast. So I got used to that break sound. And now, and I hear it now in recordings, and I'm like, ugh. And now that I got the 122, which has slow and fast, how you get accustomed to, it's all what you're used to. Yeah, and I think, I think the point you made, too, about um, sometimes you want things to sound a certain way, too, like the, with, the, um, with the, the Tron versus the really realistic strings of, of the Nord. Well, I, I don't want it to sound realistic. I want right. it to sound a certain way. That's the, that's, the, that's the charm of the Tron, isn't it, really? It's charming. So, and, like, yeah. Chris Funk makes this point, too, about my accordion. Like, he, he like, hired me for – he's, he's just, produ like, production – hired me for an accordion session and he I played one note he goes that's the that's the Decemberist accordion like every accordion sounds totally different and that is the sound like I don't think I'd ever use another instrument with this with the Decemberist because it, it just is that sound but uh, I just as a, a short follow-up that is a, a very cool setup is it is it somewhat of a logistical challenge touring that around? There's there's obviously a lot of lot of pieces there. And I know. Some of them aren't small. Well, we're lucky that we have crew people that help us, and I put it up on a riser, so they set it up on the riser, and then we can scoot it around like at festivals. And the Hammond's in a road case, so it's four people to get it out, um, and then lift it onto the riser. It's about that high, um, but people are trained for that. So when I have the keyboard, I just have a double decker stand when I have the VK7 and I, st and I stack those two, I put the piano on the bottom, the organ on top. So it's two double tiered stands. It is unwieldy. I do take up a big fa footprint for sure. I mean, Nothing keyboard land, right? So you should, right? so you should, yeah. Um, and, and just the other logistics question, Jen, is how do you remember it all? So, I mean, I'm the sort of guy that has main stage on a laptop and has some prompts for me. And going back to what you're saying about, you know, CCCC and FFF, obviously you're not doing that. <laughs> but how do you keep track of your songs, keys? How, how do you do all that? Well, with the Decemberists, I make a point to just learn the song without taking notes and just learn it and just put it in my mind. Everyone else... In my life, I have a tablet that I use this PDF reader called Mobile Sheets, and I have like, like Casey, Jerry Joseph, Ashley Flynn, little. Sue. I have banks of their charts, and I don't feel bad about it. I'm like, I don't have a good memory. I'm just gonna do that. But the Decemberists, I internalize it, and then on the Nord, you can. There's like eight live banks, so I can put in like stuff, and I'll call them like. Once in my life, strings, boom, and I just put it in there. And like for the Hammond stuff, I just know. First of all, my settings don't really change. Like I'm a sort of one trick pony with the with the Hammond. I'm like basically all stops out, 
except for these two go in like that. So they're like, it's like, I don't know. Um, it's like all stop, stop, but just a little bit of the edge taken off. And a couple songs, like I play with Architect. I do like a funk setting and do like two on the bottom and then skip two and then two halfway out to make it sound kind of gospel-y. Same with Grace Cathedral Hill too. I have a couple songs that I that I scoop it out, but mostly it's like the organ is just big. Yeah. I, I think it's just amazing um, that you c commit with the December it's everything to memory. I mean, we, you guys, before you go on tour, will you tend to learn, I'm just making numbers up here, 40 songs and know that you'll play 25 of them on any given night or... Um... We tried that to be like, what's the set lists? And then it never happens that way. Like this last tour... We were playing a new song every night, and we had this really awesome like, um, gal, Lizzie Ellison, with us singing, and we gave her a list of 40 songs, and then we ended up every night giving her at least one or two ones that she never heard before. So, I mean, it's just the nature of it. So, basically, you just have to know all of it. You know, it's been 22 years, and we've toured so much that... It gets in there, you know? Yeah, it's like, a lot of muscle memory there, which is great, yeah. I'm sure that if I got dementia and I'm on at the nursing home and they'll be like, what are the chords to why we fight? I'll be like, F sharp, B. <laughs> uh, and, and so just as the last piece you mentioned, you've got, so you've got something new coming out in March uh, according. Just tell us a little about, yeah, what you've got going on from a solo viewpoint. Oh, cool. Um, well, during COVID, there's this really awesome, like, trailer park here on the coast called the Southwester and they do an artist residency and it's called arts week and you you give them a proposal and then they'll okay it then you have to do it during the week and then you perform it at the end so I chose to make um I wanted to write this is nerdy but I wanted to write an accordion song in every one of the Greek modes so um and then I decided to use the atmosphere around me, like at the coast there, as my inspiration. So I wrote a suite of accordion pieces called the Sea View Suite, which is the town. And then on the other side of the album is a is five piano pieces that I was kicking around with and kind of finished those out. So it's like almost a classical record, I guess, with probably a more more nod to like Chick Corea and I guess it's genreless. It's weird. Let's just call it instrumental music. Um, and I'm not detecting any real love for Chick Corea, including in your background, unless I, I'm seeing <laughs> half, of, half of a Chick Corea poster there in the background. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> I wasn't even at that show, but someone gave that to me, and I'm like, I'm put fits right there. Oh, no, I love him. Especially, I mean, I love all of his music, but like these children's songs that he wrote, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're very simple and flowing with these ostinatos, like this repeating bass line, which the piano pieces, I call it five ostinatos for piano because they all base, are based on these ostinato patterns. So it's this real rolling. And they I began the piano pieces also in some modes, but then I, I don't stay strictly in the modes. I kind of move around. Like the accordion pieces stay completely in. Like I don't play a chord that's not in the mode so that's what's weird about those it also makes them you can't really tell what the one is either it's kind of weird but um so that's what that is and that's coming out in march on jealous butcher which is our friend rob jones's label who is he was the first person to put out vinyl for the decemberists because kill rock stars or capital were like we don't want to do vinyl that's stupid and rob was like i'll do it so I remember like literally stuffing vinyl at his house. Like we would all go over there wow. and so Rob's been a super pal and super friend for this whole time. And he just put out John Moen's project eyelids. He has a band that he writes and plays in and he just Rob Jones, J Jealous Portrait just made put that record out too. I feel like Rob's our side project guy. He just did Chris Funk had an instrumental record too. And he put that out. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And uh, look, Jenny, something else we'd love you to share is a standard question we yeah. ask all our guests. And uh, and I imagine with uh, your, your years of experience in, in live playing and touring, you must have a great technical or musical training. Oh, I was just thinking about that. There's a classic one that we always tell, which I'm not embarrassed anymore, but I did at a little venue in Athens, Georgia. I had a wraparound skirt that did fall off on stage. Um, 
during the show and I <laughs> did leave the stage and not return for like three songs. I was mortified. Um, so that was closed technical problem. Um, I also had a, like the Hammond, right, is a pain in the butt. So she, I call her a girl, um, doesn't always work on the outdoor venues because the power has to be 60 cycles. Otherwise, it goes out of tune. So I remember at Coachella playing this song called The Island, which is like this big Hammond middle section. And the organ was out of tune. So I played it on accordion, which it worked out okay um, in the end of the day. But that was a bummer. You know, you know, the audience probably thought, how cool, she's showing how versatile she is by choosing to play this on the accordion. So it probably... That's right. Really, and oh, really she, well. did you manage to avoid video of the, the skirt incident, Jenny? Oh, yeah, oh, that I... was probably pre... Definitely pre-telephones with good. cameras, yeah. That's been... I've, I feel so, so lucky. lucky. Hey, that's See, we're a good there, generation though. because our childhoods are not on video. Jenny, with all your years of experience playing and the, you know, the... the the various projects that you've worked in with, with other bands in your solo project, are, are there any lessons or things if you could, if you could pass mm. on to other keys players, what are some of the, the real things you've learned? Over well, the that is good question. Well, so much of it could be technical, like how to play, to make the song better, like to find your place in it. And that's, what's taken me a long time. And then that kind of goes back to the beginning of what we talked about, like, how Nate was like, stay out of the bass, like how, like to listen to the music and figure out where you can add, what's, what sonic space can you be in or should you be in? Or like, so say if the drums are doing this, the bass is doing this, the guitar is doing, maybe you do something here that holds. Maybe you are the, you're the thing that goes over the top and holds high. Maybe it needs something when the guitar goes high, you go low. Somehow think of yourself as like a sandwich. Like what ingredient do you want to be? Um, like some songs I'm the bread and I'm playing like the rhythm part, which is great. And um, I feel like meaningful. I feel like I have a job. And sometimes you're just the ketchup, you know? And the main and I, thing is not to be the ham. The ham would be like the kick drum maybe, or maybe the bass. I've had lots of philosophical questions about what food am I in a song, because I think that's, um, it's like, I think it's a good metaphor. That took me a long time and it's, I'm still working on, and not to overplay, of course, and just try to make the song better. And then I love instrumental parts. Um, I, I like to be like, well, why can't we just have a little moment of a melodic m moment here and get a breath? And try not to try not to rush. I mean, that's a huge one too. I think as we get older, we learn that musical lesson too. Like, it actually is more comfortable to listen to a music that is relaxed and not pushing. And Jenny, another common question we ask is for you to tag a keyboard player yourself. So what what I mean by that is, there's someone that you've admired over your years of playing that you would love to see interviewed about their career. Hmm. I mean, I wish people hadn't died. Um, but like Keith Emerson, I'd love to talk to him mm. and Chick. Chick Corea, I actually did a couple of his like online classes, like where you watch him do his match. And I mean, he's almost too good because he's like, you know, when you're trying to get that voicing, it's like, da -da -da -da, and you're like, I didn't get that. I mean, Keith Emerson was definitely one of my heroes. He had a lot of problems too. Mm. Um, I love Jay Gonzalez, who plays with the drive-by truckers. I feel like I love his playing. I like it, and he's great to hang out with. So maybe we should just—I should just That's go hang out with Jay. And you, Jenny, yourself were tagged by a previous guest. So just just for the record, many probably nearly two years ago, you were mentioned as someone they would love to hear. Um, so it's it's great to see you suggest others. There's not as many keyboardists out there as there are other instruments, so it's always fun to talk to people and see what they're up to and my friend Galen Clark is a Portland jazz pianist and he just he's been going on tour with uh, Sleater Kenny lately and he's got like the same rig as me like he's got his I think he's got a Dave Smith and he's got a Mellotron and a Nord so we've been talking a lot about rigs too trying to figure out he has a Hammond though I don't think he takes it on tour I, I think you're right too Jenny about keyboard players 
I, I feel like we we uh, are, are a bit of a community in the sense that there 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 probably aren't as many of us around, and, and we do. Uh, you know, we probably do suffer from terminal uniqueness. We do have some certain challenges that, that other people in the band may, may not fully appreciate. So it's, it's, it is actually nice to have that community with other players. I've found yes, that you talking about way. gear is amazing, um, and that's yeah. huge. Still can't figure out what a good keyboard amp. Like I have a Roland, that Roland amp, but the piano does not sound good through it. Does you guys have any ideas? Yeah, so I mean, Roland, Roland amps tend to cop a real, uh, r- real negative press, and I think undeservedly so in some respects. But I, I tend to use in ears, Jenny, now because I've got an EV. PA speaker that I use um, sometimes that I love and it does piano sound great on that but um, I, like I would have thought motion motion sound as you know are renowned for having good stuff as well. That's true. It just sounds good. It's a little honky yeah. like compared to a Leslie um, but yeah, I guess PA yeah. speaker. PA speakers are really good. I, I've certainly found I mean I use a, a, an EV uh, for stage monitoring and I used to use a JBL and, and they're, both, they're both quite good. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably with you. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the of the, the Roland keyboard amp. So I find, like I think pianos don't sound great through them, and strings sound strange through them as well. So I, I, yeah, I struggle with them. Yeah, bit, so, I Roland. mean, I like Roland's. Yeah. I like a lot of the other products. I've played their JV eight eighty for years, and yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I just wanted to get your ideas. No, that's well, good. Happy to help. And, and Jenny, the dreaded second last question, which is the Desert Island Disc, five albums that you, if not couldn't live without, have really influenced your life. Okay, I actually did my homework on this. Um, so, Peter Gabriel's Security. This is like, Peter Gabriel's like one of my favorites. And that's my like in my bunk at night, dance around my bunk. Uh, so record. just to interrupt, Jenny, have you heard his latest stuff from a couple of weeks ago? No, he's going to – I have heard he's going to drop a single or something. Yeah, he's dropped a single called Panopticon, and I think Brian Eno co-produced it. I think you'll like it. Oh, yes. Um, then I'm going to just say, like, for A Grateful Dead, I'm going to say without a net because it's that live with the – this is my influences and stuff um, with the Brett Midland. Um, Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin. And I was going to say Automatic for the People, the acoustic record by R.E.M., just because of the, the accordion use in there. And, um, oh, I didn't get a fifth one, so let me think about this. It's got to be a jazz record. Um, I'm just going to say, because this will be, I guess it will be kind of blue for the um, Miles Davis. And Paul. Ch- I think Paul Chambers is the pianist on that one. Talk about mellow, mellow. Talk about, like... Pulling it yeah. back. Just chill. I think that's a great diverse set you picked there. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, you know, no keyboards in the REM, but that record was um, so sparkly, and which they never toured, I guess. Like, they made the record, and then as Peter Buck lives in Portland now, and he talks about that. I think it was a tumultuous time in personal life stuff. But. I still dream of them reforming. I, I don't know whether Michael Stipe will ever do it, but I still have this hope. I don't think so. They just had like a tribute thing in Georgia and they were all there, but Michael, they all played except for Michael. I think there's just too much expectation there. Yeah, true. Yeah, that would, that, that's some of the issue, isn't it? It's living up to that. The longer you're, you're not doing it, the, the bigger the expectation builds up, which then becomes a whole mountain. In I think it's harder for singers because then the, if you don't sing as much, I think it's harder. Your muscle gets yeah. tired or harder. Yeah, I think your voice, your voice can change over time too, the way it modulates, which can mm-hmm. yeah, be a challenge, definitely. So, uh, Jenny, we, we've had a, an amazing time and a lot of fun chatting to you, but we, we always wrap up with what we call our quick fire 10. So this is... 10 questions we're going to ask you rapid fire style and we want a okay. rapid fire answer um so away we go first question first keyboard a, a you Kai, owned. uh bleh, it's a synthesizer like a1 something it's... oh yeah I, mean, I know the one you mean is it an1 i think anyway whatever maybe it is. Yeah, I, know, I know the one you mean it was it was a uh it, 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 it was early days it was in the 80s so it was like it wasn't digital it was analog had little sliders and bits yeah yeah uh, mo- most important pre-gig ritual you do? I have a beer. You'd, you'd fit in well <laughs> in all of my bands. 
What's your um, view on Kitar's sexy or sexy. an abomination? Um, excellent. Um, transpose button or adjust on the fly, Jenny? Adjust on the fly. I don't know how to use the transpose button. <laughs> awesome. The favourite show you've ever played? Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Oh, gosh. I guess I've got to say we played the Hollywood Bowl and with the LA Symphony, LA Phil, and I got to sing the Tane, and that was so amazing. Good pick. Uh, yeah. Favorite gig you've ever attended as an audience member? This is nerdy, but I saw Rush um, do their Snakes and Arrows tour, and I was up on the lawn, and to, this is really maybe TMI, but I was going through chemo at the time. But I was like, so I was all bald, but this lady gave me this joint and I was just like dancing and I felt so free and they played all my favorites because they did moving pictures like in its entirety or, I don't know, it was silly and awesome. Worst, I'm sorry, best thing about playing live? I guess just playing. That's as good as answer as any. Okay. What, the, what, the, the, worst thing, the worst thing about playing live? Having to go to the bathroom on stage. Name one thing you'd like to see invented that would make your life as a keyboard player easier. Well, I wanted someone to invite invent the gig diaper, so get that back to my stage <laughs> thing. But then I was I've been told that that was like depend like you already have that like yeah. people bath so I'm gonna say okay, um, I I want something. I think it's already been invented, but like a page turner that I can just like blink and my the page will turn. But like turn real pages, not my not my tablet, like real music that I could just blink and it goes doink. That's great. And look, I still think there's a market for gig diaper. Depends. People will have a bit of an ego thing around. Whereas if you make them look a bit rock, yeah, there could be there could be something yeah. there. I reckon there's something in that. I, I feel like something oh. thin, so you don't see it through your show clothes, and like maybe there's like some kind of tube or something. But sometimes those long shows. It is, uh, it's rough. And I've like run off stage and, you know, be, in, be, be, between the encore. Like I always have to check out where the closest restroom is. So after the show, I run to the bathroom and then run back and it's that, just. That's gold. That's it's because of the beer, the beer weird. I drink before the show. That's, the that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I could learn, but I don't learn. That, that's great. And then the last one, your favorite non-musical activity hobby. What? What lights your floats your boat to do outside of music? Um, gardening. It's funny we've only just started asking that question. I think you're the second out of about four guests that say gardening. I think it's a it's a really. Do you find it just for the peace and quiet? Yeah, and I just love plants, and I think I'd be doing that if I wasn't doing music. I'd probably be working with plants in some way. And I know. What's in your garden? Doing? Well, What's I have a native garden? plant garden mostly. Um, so lots of mm -hmm. rhododendrons. I've got snowberry, huckleberry. Um, mm -hmm. vine maple, um, oxalis, which is this like clover looking thing and you can eat it. Um, mm -hmm. lots of edible mm -hmm. things. And then in the vegetable garden, mostly just lettuce since that I have a really shady area. So just like lettuces and horseradish this year. Mm -hmm. Um, so lots of fun stuff, just trying to get more and more native plants that can survive our weird climate because it's getting weirder just like yours is. Yep. So just no. figuring it out. Exactly. Jenny, we cannot thank you enough. Um, it's, we've really appreciated you taking the time. and It's been an absolute honour to have you on the show. And um, we're really excited to see what happens in the future. Obviously, you've got many, many years or decades of, of career to go. And we're, I, 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 for one, am very excited to see it. But thank you for, for taking the time and for what you've done to date. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I've never been on a keyboard oriented podcast before, or I just feel very excited that you even chose me. So thank you. And there we have it, Paul. Um, was I too much of a fanboy? No, you were just the right amount of a fanboy, I thought, <laughs> uh, David. And there's nothing wrong with being a fanboy of great music. No. No, and it is great music, and and what Jenny demonstrated during that hour is just what a diverse. I, I mentioned in the intro what a diverse range of instruments, and and her approach you can see is informed by a range of experiences. Um, yeah, I, I just I was in awe of of what she's achieved and 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 her approach, and and so we will have links in the show notes to some of those live videos. 
Um, they are an amazing band to watch live and also listen to their studio albums well and truly, let alone all the other stuff we mentioned um, that, that she's done as well, including the Pogues. For those of you out there that like the Pogues, the Pogues cover band is great. Kiss my royal Irish ass, I, as we say down still, here. And I still love that name. Um, do, you, do you know what I took out of that? One of the many things I took out of that interview, David, was you know, Jenny, I, she strikes me as someone with quite a bit of talent who maybe plays it down a bit in the way she describes herself. Yes. But talking about that, that going from learning classical music and being, I have no doubt, very competent at that, and then having to learn to play in a band with others and it's like C, 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 F, 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 and how does this actually work? And, how, you know, I've learned now, okay, now I know the blues scale. And her willingness to, to share that learning journey with us, you know, we all start somewhere and then learn, look at her amazing facility and rock bands and pop bands now. It's, it's, uh, it's, I think there's something for all of us to, to take out of that. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. So, yeah, thank you again, everyone, for listening or watching. Um, and as always, want to give a quick shout out to our gold and silver supporters, Brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys, who's had a bit of a break over Christmas, I hope, Brother Paul, because um, you certainly had a busy 2022. Um, Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew, we could not do it without you, Tammy. Thank you as always. Um, the musicplayer.com forums. Um, again, Paul and I hang out there and for good reason. Oh, and yes, Paul's wearing the Keyboard Corner T-shirt. Highly recommended. Uh, and um, the, for those that are into recording as well, Recording Magazine, which is an iconic US-based magazine, been around for a lot of years, they now have a forum on Music Player forums as well. So if you like that sort of stuff, head in there. And our newest supporter, Radio Grande, Radio Grande, a YouTube channel devoted to bring you funk and soul reimaginings of iconic songs. Have a search on YouTube for Radio Grande. You will not be disappointed. So thank you all for your support. We'll be back, uh, as we mentioned in our live stream the other day, Paul, we've got quite a few guests booked in and it's a bit exciting. We've got mm. a whole range of people um, and so um, we'll be definitely back in a fortnight or so. Uh, but in the meantime, our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. On, we're still on Twitter, still hanging in there just um, at the keyboard chr1. Uh, and then good old fashioned email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. We are also on Instagram and TikTok. Just search for the Keyboard Chronicles, we'll show up. Mate, we're everywhere. Um, we're absolutely we're everywhere. We're everywhere. Wow. And we're also on LinkedIn. So um, wow. we've got the lot. This is amazing. <laughs> If you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength. And we do appreciate those supporters we've listed previously for, for helping us in that regard. So that's patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. Otherwise, I'm calling it for this show. Paul, thank you very much as always. Mate, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. And we're going to be busy boys over the next couple of weeks. Interviewing I know. All so and, which is a oh, good thing, right? It is a good thing. Couldn't be happier. I'm like a... I'll say pig in mud. That's not the Aussie one, <laughs> but I'll said. say it's like a pig. Not <laughs> what I said on the live stream, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, th uh, and thank you to all of you out there for listening and watching. We do appreciate it, and we'll see you back here next episode.